Cancer's Learning Technologies and Trends webinar, uh, looking back and moving forward. First of all, thank you to everyone who's on the line uh, and on the uh, GoToMeeting as well for your attendance today. We're going to be on for about 45 minutes. My name is Matt Plass. I'm the Chief Learning Officer with Interactive Services, and I'm joined today by Ed Hickey, our Chief Technical Officer, and Damien DeBarra, our Head of Instructional Design. And I also have John O'Brien, who heads up our marketing function, uh, helping us well. So welcome to the session. In terms of what we're looking to cover, if you've been on any of our webinars previously, then some of this content may be familiar to you. But we, we thought this was a great opportunity at the end of the year to recap on the year that's passed and look ahead to some of the trends and the opportunities in 2014. We've run webinars every two to three months. We've had a fantastic attendance. And if you've been part of that, thank you. They've been very successful. We've really enjoyed them. Uh, and the feedback is that people get, get something out of them. And I hope that will be the case today. So we're going to have a quick look back at 2013. We're going to touch on three key areas. One is mobile, one is gamification, and, and the third is leadership in new hire, uh, which became particularly important towards the end of the year. And in fact, when we presented at the Maisie Conference uh, in Orlando in November, that was the, the topic that we picked and we presented there with Iron Mountain uh, with Bryce Tash from their learning and development team. So we're going to spend a brief period of time looking at the year in review. When we come to looking at the next year, I'm going to bring in Ed and bring in Damien, and I'm going to ask them a couple of questions just about how they see technologies and trends for learning panning out over the next few years. And we'll finish the session with a couple of things we've either done or seen in the last few months that we think could really take off in 2014. Unfortunately, this is more of a broadcast than a discussion, but we will have opportunities for you to uh, interact through polling questions. And also, if you have a question, if you could send that through to John O'Brien, who you should see in the, uh, in the panel for this session, then he'll be able to feed the questions through to me. If I can, if I spot them in time, and if I'm able to, we'll answer them as we go. And if not, then uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have five minutes to uh, wrap up on any questions. So we're going to start with a polling question. The first topic we looked at in, in our very first webinar of the year was around mobile learning. And I remember asking a question very similar to this back then, and we had that, an interesting response. So first of all, I'd like you to tell me, if you can, um, when did mobile learning really take off in your organization? Was it before 2012? Was it last year in 2012? Was it this year, 2013? Or was it 2014? Hasn't quite happened yet. So if uh, John, if you could run that whole question now. So I think about uh, almost 80% of you have managed to vote now. Interestingly, the split is that for, for about 25% of the people on the call, it had happened before 2012. That, that's very exciting, actually, and very encouraging, um, especially as for the other 70% of people, or for most other people, uh, it hasn't happened yet. 2014 is the year in which you hope that mobile really takes off in your organization, with a few people just below 10% saying that it happened this year, which is very encouraging as well. And, and interestingly, that tallies with our experience that some of the organizations we work with were there years ago, and others are not there yet. And there aren't that many in the middle. So people either have their strategy in place, or they're still working on their strategy. So thank you for that. So one of the, the, the reasons we identified fairly early on for the lack of companies who have really gone into mobile in, in the mobile space in a big way is the overload of choice and the overload of, of activity around getting mobile learning working in the organization. There are all sorts of challenges. Some of them are technical challenges. They are around interacting with the LMS so you can track and score the content, delivering the content to different platforms, the advent of tablets, particularly the iPad that doesn't support certain uh, display technologies, has meant there's been a technical headache around mobile learning for some time. There's also an organizational resistance in some cases, particularly led by security. We are putting information onto devices that are very easy to lose, very easy for people to steal, uh, and, and they are essentially devices that go outside of the organization and therefore they put content at risk. There's also been some instructional design and training questions around how to use mobile. How long should mobile pieces be? When is the best part of a blended program to, to include mobile? Which kind of audiences will respond best? What kind of content, etc.? So for many organizations, it's just been a bit too much. Trying to solve for all of these pieces at the same time has led to a lot of goodwill, but, but also a fair bit of inertia. So when, a year ago, we asked organizations to what extent has mobile learning taken off and what obstacles do we face, the answer was very similar to the one you've given now. They'd either done it or they didn't think they'd be doing it too soon, hopefully next year. And that seems to be the case at the end of this year. 
in terms of the obstacles they faced, it was the obstacles I just described, mainly around technology, but also around the organization's readiness to allow content to disappear into the ether uh, on devices which are, as we know, very easy to break, lose, and have stolen. And it mirrored our journey, and if you, you were at our webinar on mobile learning, you'll recognize this slide. As a company that provides a service to our clients around training, and particularly mobile training in the last year or so, we've been through the same journey our clients have been through. We, we come from a background of using Flash as a technology. We had some wonderful, we still do have some wonderful templates in Flash, but iPad, iPads don't play Flash, and neither do iPhones. So we had to start looking at different technologies. We used HTML5, but unfortunately not all uh, browsers can support HTML5 yet, and most of the organizations we work with uh, are not looking to update their browsers for the next couple of years. That was an issue for us as well. Um, we also had faced the issue that sometimes you have to build twice for different devices. That higher cost, higher risk, increased testing overhead, you know, it all makes it a very difficult landscape to negotiate. And the familiar technologies we'd used started to become less wieldy when we started looking at mobile content. Uh, we put together this slide, we've adapted it a little bit in the last few months, but essentially all of these technologies, they have a good side, they have a bad side, and they have an ugly side. Um, and as you'll know, Flash is, to many people, is, is the dying technology, it's on its way out. We have HTML, which is very powerful, but, but unfortunately it can't quite match Flash when it comes to interactivity, and certainly can't match it for wow factor, or not yet anyway. Apps, which are the astonishingly cool things we see on iPads and iPhones and other tablets, well, they're wonderful, but once you've built it, you have to get it out onto the device, and that can be pretty tricky as well. Anyone who's tried to use the uh, iTunes uh, store to put apps onto a device will know what I'm talking about there. The technology that seems to stand out, the one that we're going with and the one that we've had some success with, is with responsive HTML. So it's essentially an HTML platform but it's designed to be developed once and then deployed to lots of different platforms and screen sizes. Um, you'll have seen responsive HTML. It's, it's what happens when the website that you look at on your PC changes shape when you look at it on your phone. It's that movement, automatic movement from, for example, a landscape view into a portrait view, which is fantastic. It means you can play it on lots of different devices. It's not quite at Flash's level when it comes to movement rich output. Uh, and of course, the more devices, the bigger the testing. But we think it's the way forward, and, and I think uh, a lot of our clients feel the same. So what we've been able to add fairly recently in terms of this presentation is, is what other companies are doing around mobile strategies. And it's interesting to see how it breaks across different industries. In retail, we're seeing a, a big take up on the bring your own device piece. Retail is perfect for mobile. You have these large physical formats with aisles and customers and multiple products. It's a very good environment to have to use QR codes in store, to have content available on phones and tablets that you can share with the customer so you can go on a shared journey together. Adaptive content, obviously, for the bring, bring your own devices. Retail has periods of high activity followed by downtime, and in those downtime moments, uh, mobile learning can be very useful to make the most of those two minutes, three minutes, four minutes of downtime. We found some success in video-driven content and the use of infographics to summarize content. And, and, and we're seeing a huge amount of mobile happening in retail. Telecom and media, a little bit less. Um, we are finding that a lot of the big telecoms companies are providing iPads for all of their field ops. And that could be people going into houses to set up uh, home cinema, or it could be people who are going out to uh, maintain the networks out in the field. Um, interestingly, they tended to have bought bulk of one particular type of tablet, and then assigned a certain percentage of the hard drive on that tablet for the training department. So in one case, they had 80% of your iPad is reserved for training. So it's a good strategy, and it ensures that there'll be training content on the iPad. Um, but it's also a very high maintenance and high management strategy there. Uh, but it does mean you have the full LMS integration. Pharma is interesting. Um, pharma needs to push out product updates and disease states or medical information updates to its salespeople. Uh, very rapidly. It also is very useful for pushing out sales tips to people on the floor and news and views. Uh, the, the culture around pharma changes all the time. Salespeople in the pharmaceutical industry or other influencers, they, they don't sell so much, will often need to have a quick recap on a product or a de disease state or a, a news or a view of a particular product just before they go in to talk to a doctor about prescribing that product. 
Financial services, we've seen very little uptake for mobile in, in many areas of financial services, except for financial advisor, where again, this idea of having uh, an online workbook to learn from, but also having content that you can share with a client is becoming increasingly popular. We have packaged a lot of what we know about mobile learning into an infographic. If you don't already have this, we're very happy to send it out to you. So please, uh, at the end of this session, John O'Brien will send everyone an email he's sent it today asking if you would like this, uh, or, or in fact, we'll just attach it to the email. And, and if you have it, you can discard it. And if you don't, it's worth a quick look. It contains interesting statistics around mobile. A few examples from this year, we've created mobile learning for um, the veterinary industry, for the insurance industry, for uh, major retailers where they can look at a, a store plan and go into a certain area, bring up their standard operating procedures and, and how to. So it's happening out there, uh, but it, the take up hasn't been quite as fast as a lot of industries would like. Okay, time for another poll question. We're going to move on quickly into the gamification piece. And the question now is your view of game-based learning. So before we define it, I just want to get a sense of how valuable you feel it is. So John, could you run the next poll question, please? Okay, interesting. So nobody, it would seem, does a great deal of this. 73% say it's valuable, but we don't do enough. 18% say it's of limited value, and I appreciate that could mean uh, gamification itself or the application is limited. You can only apply it to certain things. And a good 10% feel that it's a gimmick and best avoided, which is interesting. So uh, for those people, you can either stay and, and hopefully will change your mind, or the next three or four minutes, you might want to check your emails and then come back. When we talk about gamification, it's important, I think, that we um, understand what we're talking about, because increasingly, people come into the workplace having grown up playing games. And when we talk about gamification, we're not talking about full-on games. We're talking about using game design and game mechanics to engage your audience and to try and change some behaviors and learn new skills or to engage in innovation in some way. But we are talking about training that feels like a game, not a game that feels like training. So what does that mean? Well, it means you, in your training course, you might see some of these uh, mechanisms that we've borrowed from the world of games. You might have to perform against the clock. You might be accruing points as you walk through uh, the content. You might be able to collect resources as you go, leading towards some kind of advancement through levels. You might find that you're unlocking new information and, le and, and levels in there. You might find a certain sense of peril. You have lives that can be lost or energy bars that fade as you answer questions incorrectly. You'll certainly face challenges. There'll be a chance element. And very importantly from game mechanics, there's continual feedback on how you're doing. Are you doing well? Are you not doing so well? Which direction should you be moving in? So when we talk about gamification, we're talking about a game or a learning experience that feels like a game rather than a game that encourages learning. Interestingly, we did a project with a company called Integris. Um, it was a very, very successful project. It was called The Road to Integrity. And it was a board game, an online board game, based around uh, a Monopoly-style board, but with Integris branding where you roll a dice, you move around the board, you face certain challenges, and if you are successful in the challenge, you can continue, and if you're unsuccessful, you get sent to jail. This slide is interesting because it shows the path that Integris had to go down to get funding for this particular project. Now, anyone uh, on the phone who's familiar with buying e-learning will know that typically the funding is secured up front, and then we go out looking for the vendor, and then we select the vendor, and it moves on from there. In this case, it didn't work quite like that because the, the business wasn't ready to sign off on what something that felt new and untested in the organization. So we had to do some work. We were identified as a vendor. We had to do some work around producing enough collateral to prove to the funding partners that this was a worthwhile investment before we could go into the design and build. So for anyone who's looking at putting through their first piece of gamification, this is an interesting model, and it's something we'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, often, a little bit of upfront work is needed to build enough collateral and enough momentum to be able to go to the funding partners and, and secure that investment that you need. So we'll send the deck out at the end of the session. This is a, a checklist we put together. If you would like to test gamification, this might help you select a candidate for that gamification. So there will be a number of training courses that you're responsible for every year. Not all of them will be suitable for a game. And I think in the, uh, in the poll question, when we said that 20% feel it's of limited value. I, I would agree in the sense that I love gamification, but I think you can only apply it to certain things successfully. And this might help you to identify those candidates. So does the business activity itself that you're trying to train about include a competitive element? And, and obviously, the, the obvious example there is sales.
uh, any kind of sales training. It's a competitive job, it's a competitive environment, and a competitive element in the training can only help. Does the business activity involve problem solving? Again, very, very open to gamification there. Is this a topic learners may find dull? Is this a, a course they have to take once a year and the topic is considered to be quite dry and unengaging? Well, create a game and you'll see those engagement figures leak through the roof. Um, is there a seat time required for compliance? Well, again, if we have to keep someone in a course for a certain amount of time, we can make that a happy experience by adding some game element elements in there. And also, is the learner population likely to respond well to games? If you have a Generation Y or Z uh, audience there, then they are already a good platform for gamification. Uh, some examples that we've put together recently, it's everything from an online board game to a mission, uh, simulations, a, a health and safety in the home, and something we did around converting the entire town to one particular telecoms provider. Again, we've pulled some of this knowledge into an infographic, which we'll send out to you at the end of the session if you don't already have it. It's worth a quick look. It's, again, useful statistics and some good indicators of uh, likely candidates for gamification. Okay, so we're through to the third section, which is around uh, new hire, and particularly leadership. A third poll question for you. This is around uh, leadership and new hire, and particularly the focus is on Gen Y and, and Gen Z, or whatever we're calling them the next bunch. I'd like to see your opinion here around whether you think these guys demand a new approach to training and development. These Generation Y and Z people coming to the organizations, they are our future leaders. Some people are concerned about the, the culture that they bring and whether that's going to be conducive to good leadership. Um, I'd be interested to take your opinion on that now. So John, if you could share the poll question again. Okay, so that's a, a, an exact 50-50 split between people who think that we do need a new approach and people who think that we should tweak our existing approach. And interestingly and unsurprisingly, no one thinks that the current approach will work uh, absolutely perfect the way it is. So this is the present, or this, the next few slides come from a presentation we gave at the Maisie Conference in November in Orlando. Um, our proposition at the conference was that if we want to develop future leaders from Generation Y and Generation Z, then we're going to have to look at our new hire programs, and we're going to have to think about what leadership means and start pushing some of that into these new hire programs. Um, because Generation Y and Z, well, they, they play by slightly different rules. And the question is, do we, do we make them conform to the rules of the generation before, or do we work with them and try and get the best out of them? So we identified five habits, if you like, of Generation Y and Z. And, and I'll just say at this stage, this is a horrific generalization. There will be many people from that generation who do not fall into this category, many people from uh, previous generations who do. But I think as a general uh, introduction to the challenges facing most organizations with Generation Y and Generation Z intake, this is a good starting place. We have these five concepts. Don't worry, I'll Google it. Hey, everyone, look at me or look at this. Let me drive. I'll stop from instructions if I get stuck. I want to be able to do it right here. And I am what I say I am, are you? So, the Google it one is interesting. We have seen to some extent that what you could call the death of the expert. Uh, Generation Y have unparalleled access to information, and many of them don't feel the need to become an expert when they have this, this instant Google-type access to all the information they could possibly need. The traditional trusted advisor relationship seems to be moving from one of expert uh, and customer to one of customer and advisor who go on a shared journey. That, that can work very well and can be very powerful, but the question is asked, how, how can these people become leaders if they don't have that foundational expertise? How will they build that credibility? That's one of the things that we, we the questions we would be asking. The other one I would pick up here is the uh, I am what I say I am, are you? Which is really around the fact that in a way that certainly wasn't the case for my generation growing up, Generation Y and Z are marketing experts by the time they hit the workplace. I mean, they're all in marketing. They are self-published and curated online personalities with their Facebook and whatever other forms, forums that they use. They are very aware of marketing paradigms. They know their own profile is aspirational. It's how they would like other people to perceive them. It's not always 100% truthful. They recognize that in others. And they're looking at the programs we put there, and they're applying the same kind of critical lens to the program training programs that we put out in front of them. So they're going to recognize genuine, genuine rewards when they see them. 
and we need to build programs that are edgy and authentic enough to appeal to this group uh, without alienating them. It's another area that uh, we've been looking at, particularly with Iron Mountain, who have had some success in this area. What it comes down to, really, is looking at the progression from team member through manager to leader in an organization, and just saying, how can we get some of this leadership thinking into the early new hire piece? So that right from the beginning, people who are used to collaborating, used to doing things in a team, and Generation Y are fantastic for team working. They're great for saying, hey guys, let's all go do this together. They're not so good, in my experience, at saying, I have a vision, I want you to follow me, which is something that obviously we look to in leadership. So starting to get some of that thinking, of, of the leadership thinking into the early stages of new hire helps take that enthusiasm and that collaborative mindset and that excellent team working skill, but also start pushing it towards people who have visions, running with those visions and bringing people along and, uh, and making things happen. We looked with Iron Mountain at what you should put into, so looking at the practical side of this, what should go into a new hire program. And really we thought, if you want future leaders to be your output, then your machine has to contain some of these aspects that we have on the slide here. You need a piece about how you're going to be successful, not just immediately with your Google access and your uh, collaborative network, but in five years' time and ten years' time within the organization. You need courageous networking to get people out of their comfort zone and talking to people they wouldn't normally communicate. New hires need to understand very clearly what they can expect from their managers and their leaders, and they need to start lead thinking like leaders. And that means leadership characteristics need to be built into new hire programs very early on. So our new hires shouldn't be thinking only, how do I do this? They should be thinking, if I was managing this function, would I be happy here? What would I change? Do I know what good looks like? If I see something that isn't good, would I know how to change it? And when I'm leading this function at a strategic and not tactical level, would I see how this function uh, that I'm now uh, an associate within, do I see how it fits with the overall business and helps take us towards the, uh, the goals of the business? Okay, good. So we're going to move on to having a look at 2014. That was a quick recap of 2013, some of the ideas that have been uh, prevalent for us in the last 12 months. There are several factors that we think are going to affect training in the next year. Um, we're seeing a big resurgence of classroom training in ILT, but interestingly, we're seeing more mini blends, so a small piece of e-learning, a half day in the classroom, followed by a webinar, perhaps with some mobile support, in place of the long five-week five, five programs, six-week programs. Of course, there's a proliferation of tablets and bring your own device. Uh, new hire, which in the height of the crisis disappeared from most organizations in terms of uh, companies spending money on improving their new hire programs, feels like it's back. I take that as a very good sign for everyone, really, that companies seem to be not just hiring again, but putting thought into how they're hiring. We're also seeing some consolidation of content suites. Um, we've been the, the, the lucky beneficiaries in some ways of organizations who create different uh, compliance courses, for example, in silos, and they're not really aware that the same course is being, is being replicated in different areas. We've worked with some of our clients to say, look, you can bring this together into one place, and it becomes a more manageable suite. It's easy to update. It's one experience for the learner, and there's some efficiencies in there as well. And of course, social meeting places. One, one thing we could have put into this presentation and didn't is the whole social uh, informal training aspect. The reason we didn't do it is that although we've designed it and although we've talked about it, very few companies are actually doing it yet. So maybe that's one of the things that will come through in 2014. The very first bullet, top left, is the one that tells us that whatever we're doing now, we're going to have to change. OK, so I'm going to bring in Ed Hickey. Ed's our chief technical officer. Um, I'm going to ask Ed uh, the questions that we have on the slide just to get his perspective from a te technology point of view on what we think the next 12 months will look like, um, specifically in relation to you know, any changes from the way we're doing things now. So Ed, first of all, can I check that you are online? Hi, I'm indeed, Matt. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Ed. So the first question is, is about uh, adaptive HTML, and we, uh, just to recap, adaptive HTML is the HTML solution that allows you to design once and then deploy to different devices because the HTML will read the device and it will, it will change its format to fit the device that it's on. Um, but like all technologies, it's changing. So Ed, the first question is, how do you think adaptive HTML is going to change over the next 12 months? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think thus far adaptive HTML or uh, responsive HTML as it's sometimes known 
um, has been has been used on websites. So I think the the big change is going to be uh, using this technology um, in the training sphere. And as we know, um, viewing training is a different experience to, to looking at a website. You wouldn't sit and, and visit a website for 20 minutes at a go where uh, you could potentially do that with training or for longer even. Uh, so the experience in uh, taking training built in adaptive or responsive HTML is going to improve. Uh, that means that the, the, the visuals are going to improve, they're going to be less static. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, you know, bringing in some of the, the quality visuals that you would see in a flash-based course. We're going to try and recreate those in, in, in Adaptive. Um, there's also going to be more interactivity. Um, at the moment, websites would be very static in terms of, of how you engage with them, how you interact with them. But training courses, by definition, by, by design, need to be more engaging for the user to keep their attention. Uh, so, uh, responsive HTML and adaptive HTML uh, designs are going to have to change so that the user is kept engaged and, and uh, kept walking with the content. Um, yeah. And so, do you, do you think, Ed, that adaptive HTML will end up replicating Flash, looking like Flash, or do you think it will replicate it in terms of quality but look very different? I think I think in the short to, to medium term it'll, it'll still look very different. Um, it's it's a it's a different technology. It's not going to be able to do what Flash can do, but I think there's enough uh, room there to build really good uh, feeling training, good looking training, um, and take advantage of the uh, of of some of the the, the strengths of adaptive uh, to to create training that really works on mobile devices. Okay, thank you. So the, the other question that uh, I'd like to ask is around other technologies. So we, we as a company are very focused on adaptive HTML at the moment. We think it's a great solution for our clients. Um, but it's not the only technology we're working with. And what other technologies do you think are going to play a part in particularly mobile learning solutions? Well, I think some of them you mentioned in earlier slides. So the, the, the likes of um, QR codes, um, which if, if people are, are not familiar with, they're the 3D barcodes that you see on some, on pro some products. Uh, so using them with training uh, in, 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 the, in the workplace will be huge, I think, where somebody can, can look at a, a device or a, a product they're trying to sell, um, take a snapshot of the QR code and get the training immediately on about that device. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Video will also uh, play a big part in, in learning in the future, um, particularly with uh, the advances in, in streaming technology and the improvement in uh, bandwidth to devices. Um, other really interesting technologies such as augmented reality um, are going to be play a part as well where somebody can uh, again maybe look at a, a, a piece of electronic hardware and the, the, the mobile device will recognize it and be able to overlay schematics or instructions on top of that uh, live image. Um, we'll also see uh, possibly social, a lot more social media integration um, I, th I think maybe Damien will talk about that later. Um, location specific content, so people taking mobile training uh, where the device knows exactly where they are and knows what content is relevant to their physical location in the world. Um, we're going to see uh, better uh, electronic do documentation. So the traditional uh, printed ILT materials might be replaced in the future with electronic copies that the user can engage with on their on their device and, and, and save the information. Um, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, 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 and finally I'll just say uh, portals as well where um, there's a technology that's put in front of an LMS. So uh, just I think in a lot of companies the LMS is a, is a, is a huge hole just full of courses and, and sometimes the users can find it difficult to find what they need. So uh, building portals that sit in front that focus the attention of the user to a specific uh, um, a curriculum or, 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 or a, a type of learning, uh, that, that technology is going to be useful as well. Okay, thank you. And do you think that the LMS companies will keep up with the technology changes? Um, because I know one of the problems we've had or one of the challenges we've had is if we're creating mobile content, for example, quite often it's very difficult to get that content to talk to the LMS and to track and score the way we'd like it to. Um, well, <clears throat> traditionally, um, LMS advances tend to be slow, so uh, the versioning of, of LMS releases can, can be slow, and then the implementation 
particularly in, in enterprise-wide in, in large corporations can be very slow as well. I do think there's a, there's a definite scramble amongst the, the LMS vendors to, to put in place uh, the types of, of technology that will allow for seamless mobile integration and uh, uh, things like social and social uh, platform integration as well. But I think it's going to be a slow pro pro uh, process. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ed. That was really useful. Thank you. Okay. No and if you have any uh, questions, please put them into the window and we can come back to them at the end of the session. So I'm going to move on to uh, Damien, who's our Head of Instructional Design. Good afternoon. Hi. Okay. So I, we'll go straight into the questions because I want to be very mindful of time. Um, sure. Now we're looking at more of the instructional design perspective on changes for the next, uh, next 12 months. The first question really is around how learning materials are going to change. Um, we are going to be rolling out to mobile devices, so what, what, what is the big difference you're going to see there? Well, we've alluded to some of it already. I think we've talked about this, this greater use of adaptive HTML for what you might call traditional courseware. And, and I think the nature of it being on a phone is going to necessitate a shift to a slightly different form of storytelling. I think things need to be faster, more rapid, and bite-sized. Um, I also think that traditional courseware has tended to be very locked down, sort of it's an experience at the desktop, it's very isolating maybe in a way, and that as courseware or resources move on to mobile devices, particularly handheld mobile devices, I think there's a possibility for that courseware to, in a sense, open up and have a social aspect to them. Um, in, in some ways, um, it's an interesting one about the, the move back to mobile devices, that there's an argument I heard that says, you know, in a way, we're actually returning to a kind of natural state of learning. Somebody made the observation once the books were the original mobile learning device, and it was us as a training industry that kind of locked people to the desktop for the last 20 years. So I think that the overall result I think we're going to begin to see is a shift to rapid, bite-sized learning, and maybe, very excitingly, the, the combination of that with gaming, both individual gaming and collective gaming solutions for training on the mobile devices. Talking about Gen Y, um, are they really different? Do we need to have a different paradigm for those guys? Um, this is a really interesting debate. Um, I'm really torn on this. So the question is, is Gen Y learning really that different from traditional learning? Um, I think millennials, to use that other name for, for that group we're talking about, have experienced greater immersion in high-end media and have high expectations about the quality of media they interact with. Um, to me, this, the result of this is that anything we develop for this generate for that particular audience, that demographic, has to be of high quality, both visually and instructionally, and also has to be culturally relevant. So to pick a simple example of that, if we saw some gamification solutions earlier on, and one of them kind of you might have spotted it um, had the Mission Impossible kind of look and feel to it. That might be a great solution for an audience comprised primarily of boomers, but is that really culturally relevant? to that demographic we're talking about? Perhaps not, perhaps something else, another sort of narrative paradigm might be more culturally relevant. So I think um, there's, there's definitely a shift there in the, in, the, in the cultural references we need to use in training. Also in general, I think there's a general move away from what you might call the paradigm of mastering the material towards a, a more a, a condition of knowing where to find it. So the classic one of this is, you know, just as you said earlier on, I'll just Google it. A recent example is I was, um, I was having to travel for work and I had a large amount of clothes to get into a very small suitcase. I'm sure you've all had this experience. And I, I, I YouTubed up a video, which is this professional tailor showing you how to fold all your clothes in three minutes for maximum efficiency. It was excellent. Did the job. Now, have I committed to memory the seven or eight stages for folding a shirt properly? Not really. What I'll do is I'll just go find the video. It's fine. And I think that's what we're kind of seeing a shift towards is that, you know, I want to to have tools, as it were, that enable learning right now. What's important to me is what I need to know right now. So I think we're moving maybe away from mastery, more towards sort of extenuated uh, memory and uh, finding things just in the time that you need them. Mm, okay, which takes us back to the question of um, does that mean you actually have a death of expertise? I mean, I, I'm very yeah. happy for the person serving me in, in the supermarket to, to have that attitude. I wouldn't want my doctor or... <laughs> uh, children's teacher to have that attitude necessarily, but it's it's an open question. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting one. So the last one, maybe just a, a minute or so on on mm. the last question here around social enterprise networking. We we are asked quite often when we design curricula, we're asked to include a social uh, yeah. networking piece, and quite often those pieces are then rejected when we come to the final build because the organisation is not comfortable with the idea mm. of people communicating on platforms without being monitored and without any kind of um, input from senior management. So maybe you could just give us a, 
six sure. seconds on your view there. Sure. Well, I, I said first, in, in answer to the question, yes, I think that is really valuable, but I think it will become more valuable over time. There are some cultural and technical barriers to get through, but I believe those will mostly be hurdled in the next, you know, year or two. I think really, as, again, it comes back to this issue of real-time learning, and it's about equipping our learners with information that's important to them right now. Um, learning, learning tools as, you know, might begin to have a sense of persistence um, as we move into social media or social tools, moving from you know, finite releases of courses more to a situation where we have learning portals which are in what Tim O'Reilly called perpetual beta, just constant release, new information. In a way, you might put it really simply and think of the social media tools enabling a form of feed of learning rather than a delivery or a course. And I think that's going to be very, very interesting. Crucially for me, instructionally, social tools enable a move from a one-to-many to many-to-many -many broadcast model. You know, greater use of the social learning tools to, to harness the wisdom of the crowd. There's definitely some sensitivities around that, but I really do believe there's a, a great power in informal learning tools. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Damien. And I have to say, where, where we've been successful in including this in programs is where we were able to blend it, a social uh, networking piece, with a more traditional program. So where we have some e-learning and some classroom training and we're able to wrap a piece of social enterprise networking around that, we find the business is more comfortable. Programs that are more reliant on the social enterprise piece where that's the center of the program tend to be harder to find the funding for inside large organizations mm -hmm. and get the go ahead for. But thank you very much, Damien. That's uh, very, very useful. So we've just got uh, two or three minutes left. I do want to keep us to time. I promised uh, a couple of things that I think are new for 2014. I'm going to show a couple of them very quickly. Um, this is just to show that sometimes innovation can, can be low-tech rather than high-tech. Um, we have been looking at our ILT, our classroom offering for our clients, and one of the things we found really did need a makeover was our, our classroom materials, and particularly our workbook materials. And so we took some of the new technology around PDF documents, the ability to embed media and to interact with those documents, and we've come up with some workbooks uh, designs that we think are very exciting for certain populations. I'm showing you now a, a PDF document that has embedded audio. It's for financial advisors. It shows them a model that they can use with their uh, clients, and it has a, almost a commentary on the model from an expert. But then on the next page, you can not only listen to a, a sample conversation, but you can, also, you can also add your thoughts as you go. So the workbook becomes interactive. It becomes a job aid that you've personalized, and it's something that after the training experience, you can take off into the business. And using the simple technology of a PDF is very powerful because, of course, one of the things I can do here is I can save it to my hard drive, and I can email it to myself. So it's very portable in a way that a piece of e-learning or HTML really wouldn't be at the moment. So the interactive PDFs are one area that we are finding uh, we're getting a lot of uptake on. Something else I'll show you very quickly. This is a piece that we... Um, have put together. It, it, it takes the training paradigm that says you do your training first and after that you have some performance support. It turns it on its head and says we're going to start with the performance support. So this is an HTML page you can access on your phone or on a tablet. It outlines the 10 or 11 steps in performing a particular task and if at any time you need to dig into one of these steps you can open it out and you'll find inside a video that explains how to perform that task and then below the video go you'll also start finding some step-by-step -step links uh, out to other pieces of training. So rather than presenting a training course followed by job aids or summaries as performance support, we start with the performance support and we say, we're not going to track your use. You may be very familiar with 8 out of 11 of these steps, but for the steps you're not familiar with, go in, have a look, get the overview from the video. If you still want to learn more, use the rest of the content or the links to drill down into more formal pieces of training. So that performance support mechanism is also very popular at the moment. And the last thing um, I will show you very quickly, which I alluded to earlier, is this idea of the, uh, the suite. Here we, we've picked a compliance suite where we have several compliance uh, courses, anti-bribery code of conduct inside the training. We're packaging them into one position. We're putting them into a portal. When the learner comes into the portal, we can ask them their language. We can then tell them to give us their job role, how long they've been with the company, the responsibilities. And what we're doing, we're actually cutting content. So with every decision the learner makes here in their profiling piece, we can cut out the content that isn't relevant for them. So that means less time away from their desk and, and greater efficiencies there. We're able to put a, a short video showing how the compliance center works and all the courses in a carousel. Uh, and then down the bottom, we have some infographics for those guys as well. So when they come into this HTML page, they take the profiler, 
It shows them which courses are relevant to them. When they open a course to begin, the first thing it does is introduce a, a short quiz. And again, this is a, a second tier of profiling. That quiz will identify the content that they're already familiar with, and they, can, they have tested out that content. But it will also identify the content they're not so familiar with, and those are the pieces that, that they need to complete in the more formal e-learning so that they can prove their compliance. So what we've actually done is taken training that we've been developing for some of our clients for years and pulled it into one place behind a portal with a profiler which means it's easier to manage from the client side and from the learner side. They take less training, they take it faster, and they only have to do the pieces that we've proven they need to do. So there's some, certainly some efficiencies there. Okay, so we're up on time now. Um, thank you very much for your uh, participation today. We're going to finish up with one last polling question, which is where you think in your organizations you're going to be innovating next year. And I see we've got at least one question which we'll try and get to. Um, so, John, if you could run the last poll question now. So, mobile is the big goal. 38% uh, of you think that mobile is where the innovation will happen. 10 or 11% it's going to be in the classroom. 22% see it in gamification. Another 22 in compliance. And again, sort of 10 or 11% in new hire. So, mobile and compliance coming out as the, uh, sorry, mobile coming out as the, the leader there. Gamification and compliance, second most likely areas to innovate. And then the classroom and new hire training bringing up the rear. So that's very useful insight into where you think your organizations are going. Thank you. So we're at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attendance. We had a question from uh, Jeff who was asking, uh, he picked up on the comment I made about a resurgence in ILT and asked where we're seeing that. Jeff, we're seeing it in uh, business services companies primarily, but we're also seeing it in financial services. So about four or five years ago, uh, financial clients that we have told us to stop designing classroom programs and start designing e-learning programs. They were more cost effective uh, for the organization. Now they're saying, actually, we like the classroom. It gave us a, a more rounded experience. We want to start bringing some of that classroom back in. So I could say it's across all industries, but financial services is where we've really seen the uptake there. OK, so thank you, everyone, for your time. Any questions, please do get in touch either through the, uh, we'll keep the question panel open for the next few minutes, but also uh, you can contact John and uh, send questions directly to us and we'll answer them. If you'd like to get in contact with any of our account managers, if you don't know who yours is already, we have Glenn in San Francisco, Dan Brown in uh, Bentonville, Paul in the UK, uh, and Emir, he's based in Barcelona, Neil in New York, and Mark Deroche also in New York as well. So I'll leave those contact details up there for you. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And thanks to Ed and Damien and John as well. Happy holidays. Goodbye. <laughs>